It's quiet now, but all police leave in the capital has been canceled. They're taking no chances. After last week's anti-globalization protests in Quebec and the street wars on this spot during the same meeting last year of the IMF and World Bank. So what's their complaint? The protesters say that what we have here is a conspiracy. The World Bank, the IMF, the World Trade Organization don't help the poor of the world. They're here to crush them. All the bosses are here today. Let's ask them. Mr. Wolfenson, the protesters say that you are the chief of a secretive, undemocratic world government, which has actually made poverty worse worldwide. Mm -hmm. How do you respond? Well, I think it's nonsense. <laughs> I mean, it's simply, I mean, I've been accused of many things, but I haven't, uh, I didn't know that that was one of the accusations. Um, I'm not sure where this government exists. Uh, well, but if, if I can answer more seriously the question, uh, which I think what is behind it, is that I'm very proud, actually, of the record of the bank. But that's not what the insider says. Now, you should really take advantage of somebody who's down and out and try to squeeze the last ounce of blood out of them. Joe Stiglitz was chief economist of the World Bank, so he should know. He was in the meetings when the World Bank and the IMF met to decide the fate of nations. They were making the countries worse off. And he charges the IMF actually encouraged corruption. They take a strong position on petty larceny, on petty theft, but at grand larceny, they'll, they'll look the other way. The insider says there's a one-size-fits-all plan. Every nation gets the same exact four-step program to the free market paradise. Step one, freedom for hot money. Step two, freedom to increase prices. Step three, free trade for all. And step four, where it all begins, is the freedom to privatize everything. And the insider saw how it worked in Russia. Well, that was the extreme case. You turned over these assets to these oligarchs at a time when the government didn't have enough money to pay measly pensions to the old age people. It was turning over billions of dollars to these few oligarchs for a fraction of the value of those assets. How could the IMF let this happen in their privatization program? When it comes to corruption in Russia, they're more willing to turn the other way. The IMF and the U.S. Treasury actually almost encouraged it. There was a real commitment to a particular set of leadership to Yeltsin. There was a fear that if he didn't get reelected, who knows what would happen? And so the belief was the means justified the ends. Stiglitz charges the U.S. government used the IMF to fix the Russian elections. Stiglitz isn't guessing. At the time, he was in Clinton's cabinet as the president's chief economist. The U.S. Treasury's view was this is great because we want Yeltsin reelected. We don't care if it's a corrupt election. We want the money to go to Yeltsin to be reelected because he's our friend. Step two is what the World Bank calls a poverty reduction strategy. In Tanzania, the bank's idea of a poverty reduction strategy was to require the government to raise the price of medicine during an AIDS epidemic. In Bolivia, the bank's poverty reduction strategy was to demand increases in the price of water. That strategy produced riots. And in Ecuador, the poverty reduction strategy included increasing the price of cooking gas by 60 percent, and the nation exploded. The riots in Ecuador came as no surprise to the World Bank. We've obtained some confidential documents from inside. This one's the master strategy for Ecuador. It says the bank knew that their plans pushed down real wages and shoved 51 percent of the population below the poverty line. They even scripted in riots. They said their plans would lead to social unrest. The insider heard the same story about Indonesia. They had been warned if the policies of austerity were continued, economy would go down. The probability of social and political turmoil was very high. They've been warned. And the unfortunate thing is those predictions came out to be true. <laughs> Finally, the whole cauldron blew up and did enormous damage from which the country has still not recovered. What got Indonesia was step three of the IMF assistance program. 
ending all controls on capital. This left Indonesia's fate to the mood of speculators and what Stiglitz calls hot money. In Asia, it was the nations that refused the IMF medicine that escaped the financial flames. Both of them weathered the global financial crisis very well. India has been having growth rate over the past decade of an excess of 5%. China's growth rate has been even faster. Neither of them follow the dictum of having capital market liberalization. Step four, free trade. According to the insider, the World Trade Organization just makes the rich richer. So much so, so much so, that after the last round of trade negotiations, the Uruguay round in 1994, calculations of the World Bank showed that sub-Saharan Africa the poorest region of the world was actually worse off by, by more than 2%. While the United States was bragging about how many billions and billions of dollars better off it was. Stiglitz says the WTO operates like the British Empire in the Opium Wars when Britain forced China at gunpoint to open its markets to British narcotics. The new drug wars are over the WTO's intellectual property treaty. Until this month, British and American drug companies use WTO rules to prevent AIDS victims in South Africa from getting cheap medicine. South Africa said, you know, we want to be able to produce that drug ourselves and sell it at cost that the people can afford. And the drug company said, if you do that, you're violating intellectual property rights. We don't care if people die. Intellectual property rights are, are really supreme. And people heard about this. And they are outraged. And the protesters took such pressure that today now the drug companies have backed down. One lost skirmish for the drug companies, but the deadly WTO rule still survives. And back at the IMF and World Bank spring meeting today, World Bank chief Jim Wolfenson is still musing about world domination. Uh, we've done a lot of things well. We've made a lot of mistakes. But no more or no less than I think any other highly intelligent, well-meaning group of people in the most difficult area. And in some cases, I really wish I was president of a world government, because then I could make sure everything worked, uh, knowing, as you all do, of my great skill as an administrator.